Thank you for staying for our question and answer uh, session. I'm sure you have questions. And I'm so grateful to all of our speakers today for giving us such a, a rich morning uh, of discussion about museums and, and American art. I thought in the spirit of collaboration, um, as you know, Behold America is the, the product of the work of staff, both uh, present and past, of the Timken Museum of Art, Museum of Contemporary Art in La Jolla, and the San Diego Museum of Art. And so I thought I would ask my colleague, uh, John Wilson, the director of the Timken Museum of Art, um, if he could uh, begin today. John, if you could just raise your hand to Daniela um, and ask uh, the first question. Thank you very much. This on? Yeah. Good. This is for uh, James, actually, just as you're putting a bottle to your mouth. Um, when I used to work in Omaha, we, there was a lot of work with Indian tribes, and the, um, one of the things that one of them told me was that um, was only the whites said Native Americans, and we, we call each other Indians, and it sort of reflected what you said a little bit earlier on. Uh, and it was interesting, and I've always sort of, your comment about the, the warriors and the powwows, we used to go to powwows a lot when we were in that part of the world, how the beginning of every powwow, a, the, the colors are brought in because they're so proud of being warriors. And in the context of this, of identity, um, I haven't been able to figure out why the, on the various um, controversies over the naming of university athletic teams, where University of North Dakota calls themselves the Fighting Sioux, when that sort of reflects a warrior culture. And I'll leave aside the, you know, the, the, why the Fighting Irish are, are still okay, but that's another, another issue. Um, if there's a, how that is seen as a reflection of identity in, in, in Indian culture uh, today. Well, yeah, it's still a controversial issue. And I, I think that the, <clears throat> the fine line is, um, can be defined as respectful. You know, where, um, uh, <clears throat> well, I had no problem with uh, the Indian motorcycle because there, 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 was, um, there was a lot of things going for it. There was, one, there was dignity. And I think that's an important thing. Whereas, um, there's so many things that are native out there that are misused and, and people just don't don't have a conscious of it and and I just think you know uh, that that is the dividing line I mean they would be the fighting Irish but there could be the fighting towheads you know which which is better you know um, potato heads or whatever you know I, um, so the first thing for me is respect and dignity. If, if, the, if, the, if the Sioux people, and there's seven bands of them, uh, maybe more than that counting Canada, um, objected to it, then, then I would be behind them. But if they, if they didn't object and that fighting Sioux was, was uh, presented with a dignified way, then, then that, would be, that would be their choice. Um, you know, certainly, I mean, Chief Yahoo d doesn't do us any, any, any favors or the tomahawk chop and what that represents, you know. So I, I think, you know, um, it, it's how it's presented and, you know, um, how, um, how offensive it can be. Uh, I remember, speaking of the Sioux, uh, there was a crazy horse malt liquor that was brought out in the 90s. And it was on only the stands for a couple of weeks because all the Indians stood up and said no. Because what, what uh, liquor represented in our culture is what it's done. And then to take a revered chief like that and name it, you know. But we still have Thunderbird wine and, and uh, other things out there. So I, I think it's a, it's a thing of respect, but it's... Um, <sighs> yeah, well, I, I know there's some advocates that say all or nothing. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure about that. You know, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a football fan and a sports fan, and I, uh, I think there's, there, there has been some representation that does, um, does um, inspire. Great, thank you. I, I have a question, actually. Um, 
much for Trish and also for Derek. Um, I'm not sure if anyone on the panel had the opportunity to see the Land Art Show that recently took place at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, but it was billed as you know the greatest land art show ever, the biggest survey, and many people that um, were included in your essay for the catalog, Trish, and in your presentation today were included in that um, exhibition. But for me, what I, what I thought was a little confusing was it was really hard, I think, for people not familiar with land art or not familiar with these artists to really understand the exhibition. The works were great, but it was sprawling, very little didactic text. And I wonder, as, as a professor, as a museum director, um, if you have any comments on, you know, how do we present contemporary art when it is minimal, um, when it is <coughs> not painted, um, it is conceptual, and in ways for audiences. I think here at the San Diego Museum of Art, we're always trying to walk the fine line between creating great, groundbreaking, you know, excellent shows, but also appealing to the widest audience as possible. Well, I'm, I'm definitely disadvantaged as an art historian in terms of, you know, when I, when I talk about the work that I'm engaged with, I don't have um, necessarily the ability to show these incredibly luscious paintings where there are so many forms and colors and, and so much evidence of the art, artist's hand. Instead, I have the completely monochrome white painting that, um, you know, that I, th that I think is pretty luscious and incredible, but which I'm often in the position of convincing my public. It always reminds me of a professor that I used to teach with at DePaul, um, Simone Zrowski, who said to me once, um, she's a 17th century specialist, and said to me once, oh, you work on minimal art. There's nothing to that. And, um, and you know, it, it, it puts you in that position of trying to, to really figure out then how do you bring it to a public and what are the ways in which you think about it. And certainly with um, an exhibition of land art, up because you know how do you get a public engaged who may or may not know that much about the work and it brings up I think what David was saying about participation I mean um, as somebody who works with participation in another kind of way um, relational aesthetics issues of um, engagement with the work maybe more of what you were dealing with with the artist who produced the wave um, project in Seattle it's on the one hand you're you're interested in participation. How do you make an audience excited about something, as excited as you are, without those years of schooling and training? At the same time, it's um, you want to control that participation in certain kinds of ways to make sure that you're respecting artists' in intentions, that you're that you're um, creating a kind of critical dialogue around work, that you're actually allowing people the opportunity to feel an investment in creating knowledge, as opposed to just um, you know, feeling good about um, the fact that they're just even there. So I think that that's, for me, the issue. How do you get people excited, even if the work, you know, is, is more didactic or documentation-oriented, such as what I was showing today for much of it, um, it's providing a critical apparatus for an intellectual engagement, I think, that is really important and, and incredibly needed if we think about the relationships between the arts as a, as a um, the importance of the arts in really creating a context for sustained intellectual critical thought. So, um, and that's what we're all in the business of, right? But it's just how do you find your way in? So, um, so I think of Simone and that that line, minimalism. There's nothing to it, quite a lot, actually. But. Thanks. I, I didn't see the show in Los Angeles, although I now wish I had, so I could have a finer point of response, but I, I think that land art, at least my understanding of it, is so dependent upon participation and getting there and making the investment in time and energy that it's a shame when it's reconstituted in a museum for that element to be left out. And I think that that's, it's, I used to say this all the time to my students and probably will again, you know, we, Contemporary art may be difficult, but it's our art, and we're obliged to understand it. And I agree with you that I think we need to provide as many tools as possible for the deepest possible intellectual engagement with the work, one that doesn't cheapen it, but that um, respects its sincerity and um, offers as broad an audience as wants to be interested access. Are there any questions from the audience?
Pierrette, please. <coughs> okay. I, I have questions, I have comments. Um, the symposium was riveting to me and um, it touched on so much of my life. Trish, the reason I became an art historian was because of Wrapped Coast. And then it was followed by Robert Smithson's uh, Spiral Jetty. Actually, even though I went to Oxford and studied Renaissance, the reason I became an art historian were, was because of those two projects. Because finally I wasn't bored at looking at chikum, 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 chikum. And for those of you who are art historians, you'll understand exactly what that sound means. <laughs> All right. Uh, James, what I have to say to you is, you know, they have skinny girl margarita, so get over it. Um, <laughs> they, the advertising business is in the business of marginalizing all of us, you know, and that's just what it is. Um, Deborah, I worked for James Dimitrian at the Des Moines Art Center in the most formative days when you had an exhibition there. And, you know, it started with Cindy Sherman and then it went to you and then Jenny Holzer. I never, ever forgot as this young person, and you were young then because we are not that far in age, looking at your horses. And, you know, I was in the education department then and going in there and touching them. And one was laying down and one was standing up because I rode horses my whole life. And um, it was an experience that every time I see your work as the portraits of they are, for anybody who ever wrapped their legs around one of those beasts and had the joy and the fear of wondering if they were gonna survive or not, um, has it. So uh, that's all I can say about your work is that they're fantastic, unbelievable. Um, Derek, you are so right about participation in museums, so, so right about the fact that if they don't start involving people and opening up the way that people participate in museums, there will not be participation as it is. And the point in case of that is something like Pinterest, where they have pages. Pinterest is this thing on, on, uh, on uh, wherever, whatever, on the web where you choose images, and it's a phenomenon, and there are pages and pages and pages of people self-curating their own shows because they are so desperate to have a voice in what visual culture is about. And um, I think one of the ways that we have to solve that in terms of funding is that we have to start counting the funding uh, as audience participation of people who actually go virtually to the museums and cause that as part of the count because that is going to be the way that 90% of the world is going to interact with these cultures and you're absolutely right. This is the generation that they need to engage because they were brought up on Montessori schools, parent-child workshops, interactive things, and if they don't get a chance to put chewing gum on the wall, if they don't get a chance to put a line somewhere, or they don't get to walk in, they just aren't gonna come because other places will engage them in that way and that is a tremendous, more than anything else as a professional, and I'm now an art dealer, but I spent my life being a museum professional, and that's where I live, is probably the single most important things that have to confront museums today, and you have nailed it. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Hatt, you and I are kindred spirits. We are <laughs> art historians, and your um, relationship to what James did with the ghost dance was phenomenal, even for him. Mm -hmm. um, I really respect your practice. So, do I have a question? No. Do I have a comment? <laughs> Always. And I want to thank you all. And Amy, you know, Behold America is an example of what museums must do. It started with the Tate Modern way back when, when they integrated, you know, conceptual works with paintings. And it is so important because the Timkin, more than anything else, is a, is a place where I go into, but it is a lot of the same old, same old. And to be able to see conceptual and minimalist art on the walls of the Timpkin, to be able to see some sexy, macho James Sarah on a pink padded wall, as Hugh Davies so pointed out and, and everything, is probably more than any of these other museums, the Timpkin is gonna benefit from that because it regalvanizes their spaces in a way that um, you know is really necessary. Of course, the San Diego Museum of Art has that pull automatically, and um, I have to say, that um, 19th and 20th century conventional landscapes in uh, you know, the contemporary museum look ridiculous. Um, and that is uh, a case of architecture, which is, was designed to respond to a certain case of peace, but that is also a tremendous comment on how 
provincial and out of place they look because the architecture for that museum was specifically designed in another way. And thank you for that because it really is going to create a tremendous dialogue and it will bring people to the museum because it will allow them not to compartmentalize their viewing, which is what's been happening here for way too long. Anybody else? Thank you, Pirat. Thank you so much for being a participant uh, in our arts community here in San Diego. I saw another hand as well. Um, Butterfield, you uh, mentioned uh, using horses in therapy. Uh, art can be a form of therapy, but can you elaborate on the use of horses in therapy and how yes. successful has it been? Uh, sitting on the back of a horse is the closest thing to walking uh, in the way it moves your spine, and so. Uh, from 1990 to 1995, I had the therapeutic ride riding program called Eagle Mount in our particular town at my barn. I had just built an indoor arena and I wanted to share it. And my boarders and I used all of our lower level but trained dressage horses who were very sensitive to, to being um, symmetrical as uh, the therapists. It, it was remarkable. One young girl came in with uh, oh, oxygen deprivation. She, was, she came in in a basket, pretty much. She had a twin sister who was beautiful and normal. I think she was in about fifth grade and weighed about 60 pounds. And she was very spastic and couldn't even support her own uh, trunk. We put her on punch um, with a bareback pad and someone would sit behind her the rhythm of the horse, the warmth of his body, the breath of his ribs going in and out, the smell of his skin, the touch of his fur, the noise he made, and the movement of his pelvis made this little girl have to sit up. So when we would sit behind her, we wouldn't hold her up. You would kind of make your, your hands like a cage around her ribs and prompt her to sit up. And in three summers, she came walking in on a walker. And I, I mean, actually in one day, in 20 minutes, you saw the difference. And she would make progress every summer, and then no progress. We couldn't do it in the cold weather in Montana. And then every summer, they tried to get it as part of the therapy program in the, in the public schools. Uh, so horses can be, in that way, they're so, four-dimensional. They're so profoundly present. When you're with a horse, they're so big and so powerful, and yet they, they tend to want to have dialogue with a person. They want to do work with a person. It's very formal. Vicki Hearn, in her, her book, Adam's Task, Calling Animals by Name, talks about the difference between romping with your dog and asking your dog to sit like with an a capital S. It's like the I and thou relationship of Martin Buber. There, <coughs> there is you, and then there is you with a capital. When we engage in this dialogue between human beings or without, with animals as profound beings or with an idea, we are engaging in a more spiritual, formal dialogue. And on that level, these horses accept people who have brain damage, who have emotional problems, who have autism. Uh, I specialized in head injuries, and we had a, a program where a therapist came from Denver to work with all the physical therapists in Bozeman, and my horse Rex, I was supposed to drive him from the ground, and the therapist sat on him, and I was supposed to put him in a shoulder in, in which the horse is walking and brings his shoulders to the inside, and it makes the left hind leg lift the butt more and gets his leg under him more. Well, she wanted to demonstrate how with a person who was hemispherically damaged and collapsed to the left, how the shoulder and left could help the person sit up. Well, she sat like this on Rex and Rex is like, he takes his body and goes whoop and sat her up straight. <laughs> Cause he's like, I can't do a shoulder in with you sitting like that. But, and she said, oh my gosh, you know, the horse has corrected the problem. 
Another um, man who had been, he was blind and had been run over and was paralyzed and had never spoken since this accident. We would put, we built a saddle for quadriplegics for Rex and we put him on there and after about three weeks, he on his wheelchair was underneath Rex talking to him and he talked to Rex. And the same with autistic children, they can talk to the horse sometimes when they're not able to talk to people. The other thing is Ernie was a very huge man and you know he had urine bags and it was really awkward and, and when you're with a person in a wheelchair who's a quadriplegic, you feel awkward, you're embarrassed, you don't know what to do. When you're on a ramp with five big guys trying to get a 280 pound man onto the back of a horse, you get over it. He gets over it. You laugh, you joke, you, you just do what has to be done. And it takes all of that, that superficial stuff away and it allows you to become close to them because you're all trying to solve a problem. And then he did these paintings looking down on the neck of the horse and how it was so different to be able to see the, view, the world from the back of the horse. At the Walker Art Center, they wanted me to do a piece when I was a visiting artist that involved the community. And so we got, uh, you know, the brass stanchions with the velvet ropes. We made a little arena in the front of the museum, and we did a therapeutic riding program. And the sheriff brought three horses, and we did a demonstration in, in front of the museum. I don't know, they're just, they, they kind of blow you away when you're, you're working with them, all the training that you've done, they take and with their own intuition and knowledge, they multiply it and they actually respond to these people in a way that is profound and that is beyond anything you've ever taught them. It's, it's overwhelming. Sorry, I could go on all day. <laughs> Hello, I'd like to know, James, how do you deal with the rudeness of the people when you come and give a presentation um, about art and within a Eurocentric environment. Um, I don't know how you do it. Thank you also very much for coming. Well, when, when I perform, I mentioned I, I go someplace else, but I also am cognizant of um, that every audience is unique and um, that when I script, you know, I have a certain idealistic way that I approach it. There's uh, <clears throat> a secret that uh, many times I script for Indian people first. Uh, and so that keeps me centered. And uh, it isn't to please Indian people, it's that I'm speaking to someone that understands what I'm, I'm talking about, all the nuances. And I also realize other people don't understand but, but that's part of the work, is, is sort of revealing and sharing a portion of my culture they don't know. So, um, yeah, there's only been a couple times that I've gotten angry. And, and um, but I mean, that, that's sort of uh, part of being an artist, taking a risk. And um, that goes for non-Indian and Indian audience, because uh, I've been angered by both. So it, it just, um, I mean, I, I'm not an entertainer. I think a, probably, uh, I, I, I wasn't say an informer, but that's not, that's right either. Probably, probably, I'm probably an educator as well as an artist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think what you are is real. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deb. I, I'm not sure how well I can articulate what I'm thinking, feeling, because my response to you all is not uh, in my head it, it and that's how I respond to your art also it's not in my head and um, Tris referred to geography and how the artists that you were referring to all this is opens up my mind to how the artists at the time that you were referring to chose where they were as part of the definition of what they were doing as part of the it was part of the art actually where the and and I wanted to ask if that were true of Deborah and and James I had a home in Montana I love Montana 
my second favorite place is the Big Island of Hawaii, and you create your art there. And, and James, you're, you're from here also, and I was stunned the one time I went to the Alcala um, Cathedral that we still had Indian schools in the 1930s. Kids were still being segregated. And one of the most spiritual experiences I've had in my life was going to Little Bighorn, and, and, I, and I didn't expect that at all. I thought it was just a tourist destination, and I, I was incredibly moved. Um, you do that, both of you, in your art. It's not just the art. It's, I, I was so happy to hear that your, your horses are self-portraits. I didn't know that. And I can feel that, I can see that, and that's the beauty of what you're doing. And you just said to James, what he does is real. And that's what I was respond to, and I didn't know if the geography of what you're doing has anything to do with your art also. For me, I, it definitely does. I mean, my reality is wolves and moose and elk and deer, and you know, my husband hunts and we have a herd of elk that live on our hayfield in the winter, and horses, and you know, blood and guts. I mean, surgeries, horses die. We board another 15 horses. I'm, I'm responsible for a lot of souls. And so it is a different reality than most people. Um, nature really is, you know, I almost couldn't get here because we had a foot of snow overnight. And, you know, we just have. Our, our moment, our present, is just a little different than, than a lot of people. And a lot of my friends who are artists in Montana, they're contemporary artists. And, and one of them, who's such a fabulous artist, was struggling with feeling she had to make work about global warming and politics. And I just wanted to say to her, you know, you need to just make the art that you want because it will shine through. And, and our environment, I always put my foot in my mouth, so I could not do well in New York City. I need to decentralize myself <laughs> so that I can have the, um, I don't need that constant supervision and criticism. I also don't need the dialogue. It's so overwhelming and exciting to come here to the city to get language from people. But really what fuels me is not so much verbal. And, and we need all these voices. We need uh, Arneson's work was so much about responding to other people's art. And it was fabulous. It was this commentary. But that's why each of our art is important, because everybody has their own voice. And they bring this little piece of the puzzle to the table. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, 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 I could feel. Uh, and visualize a, a nice ride with you in a pickup and not having to say anything for several hours. That's a compliment. I am I'm just so impressed with all of you and with what you have been doing and, and your life's work. I'm, I'm thinking of the problems of the museum in Euro-American life and what it has come through from its beginning as the private cabinet of curios of the noblemen uh, to uh, the large uh, museums built by the robber barons, dare I say, uh, to reflect well on bourgeois life of, of the 19th and early 20th centuries. And then uh, certainly with the Armory Show and other things at the beginning of the 20th century, the explosion of the kinds of things that would be represented. And this has gone on and on. But I'm thinking of the problems, the museum that needs the contribution from the big oil companies, uh, from the very, very wealthy donors, and yet wants the right to show Maplethorpe's photographs. Uh, so how, how, does, how do you museum people and artists and educators? Uh, how do you reconcile all of this? How do you do this fantastic juggling act of not 
I mean, not alienating the public, uh, of making art that is very difficult accessible, uh, of not alienating the donors. I, I, am, I am just, uh, I, I think it's a huge puzzle, but I would love to have some of your comments on this. I think we should think of it as a carbon tax credit that perhaps big oil could just sort of, yeah. there's a carbon art credit and a carbon tax credit. <laughs> That's great. And this is a very wishy-washy answer. It boils down to pragmatism. You know, and from colleagues I know who run museums, work in museums, of course there are problems, there are ethical problems, there are problems with different demographic groups and so forth. But in the end, if you want to keep the building open and get people in and sort of do the sorts of things that Derek was talking about in terms of participation and in, in the UK we have the term outreach, I don't know whether you have that here, but, you know, which kind of is, yeah, um, that actually I think, you know, you sort of said it yourself, it's a juggling act. It's sort of walking a fine line. In a sense, I'm very lucky. As an art historian working in a university, I can just do my own thing and look at this from the outside and be as critical as I like of the kinds of decisions that are made without having to really think about the very real diplomatic and financial problems that museums face. Um, and I think in terms of the sorts of scholarship that's done on the contemporary museum. Much of it's terribly important and needs to be listened to, but needs to be tempered, and this is by voices from within museums, explaining exactly what the constraints are. So, you know, when a particular critic rails against a museum and says, why aren't you doing this, 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 and this? Why are you taking sponsorship money from these places? You know, in a way, there needs to be a voice back explaining properly what's, what's going on. That is a wishy-washy answer, but it's all I can say at present, I think. Okay. Um, I think that museums today face a horrendous array of choices and that they're in a near state of crisis because of all these contradictory choices, some of which you've named for us, Janet, that they're being forced to make. That said, I think we could, if we were good, rigorous historians, look back at the history of museums in the United States or the history of state museums in Europe and see that there's always been a kind of uh, critical urgency to decisions that are being made. And I, I guess so that we don't end this conversation on a negative note, I think we should really look at the accomplishment that a project like Behold America represents in my own field of American art where there are periodically these large um, epic efforts to gather together American artworks from um, across periods and uh, from many museums. In one city you've produced this major exhibition with a catalog that values the voices of artists as well as scholars. It's going to be a lasting document about the strength that the resource that exists here in San Diego for a field that too little considers this place. And I think that that's a great thing that a museum has done during a very difficult time to pull off anything of this scale. And so I think that's the way we should end is to just say thank you to Amy and Julia and John and all the people who made this happen because it's a major accomplishment, not just for San Diego. Thanks. And thank you to all of you and to our very distinguished speakers today. Take care.